Despite a solid foundation with every advantage provided it, with what could have been an immense success, was squandered and relegated to the back end caps of history. The TurboGrafx-16 is what happens when a player is given a perfect hand with all the cards needed for victory, but the player lacks the prerequisite knowledge to play them. The TurboGrafx-16 was a perfect marriage of the video game industry and a tech industry leader. A large tech giant wanting to enter the console gaming space with a system that outpaced its primary competition. This combination would make you believe the system was a surefire hit. However, unlike Sony with its immensely successful PlayStation, NEC played its hand completely wrong, and TurboGrafx-16 never reached its full potential in the United States. The Nintendo Famicom was released in 1983 in the Japanese market, and it dominated it and would continue to do so for the next several years. Despite advancements in technology, the Japanese home console market stagnated around the Famicom's limitations. The console maker Sega was also on the market at the time, but they never quite made a large enough dent in the Japanese market to really impact the might of the Famicom. The TurboGrafx, then known as the PC Engine in Japan, was developed by Hudson Soft as the next logical step in the Japanese home console market. Hudson Soft, as Nintendo's first third-party developer and publisher, thought they could potentially pitch a new console to Nintendo. In a Gamasutra article, Rich O'Keefe discusses the relationship that Hudson Soft had with Nintendo after they had released the Family Basic, a keyboard and cart that allowed for the creation of software on the Famicom. The Family Basic relationship is why they thought they could get away with designing Nintendo's next video game system, O'Keefe says. The problem was, Nintendo wasn't interested in Hudson's design, and the company wasn't large enough to manufacture a console on its own, just engineer one. In the same article, it stated that Hudson Soft even approached Sega with their console design, but was turned down. It's also known that Hudson Soft pitched the Hue Card game format to Nintendo as well, which it's been insinuated that it inspired Nintendo's disk drive. But that's another story. Hudson Soft, turned down by just about every game company, looked to NEC, a company Hudson Soft had experience with, creating software for NEC's line of personal computers. NEC is said to have been eager to jump at the idea. NEC had been looking for a way to expand its reach into the home console space, and up to that point it had been dominated by Nintendo. NEC said it had been talked into the deal by Hudson Soft because they were shown how much money Nintendo was making. The deal between a tech giant and a gaming pioneer made the prospective console unlike any before it. The resulting deal basically made the system have two masters, NEC and Hudson Soft, who would both support the system as software publishers. Hudson Soft would be the driving force behind original content for the console, while NEC would focus on finding games to port over to the platform. However, in this deal, Hudson Soft took the lion's share of the treasure. Because Hudson Soft had been the ones who primarily developed the console, the CPU and GPU, Hudson Soft would get royalties on every system manufactured and on every game sold, because Hudson Soft had also developed the Hue Card technology the games for the platform were sold on. NEC would make their money off selling the hardware primarily, as NEC would handle the console production. So right out of the gate, the deal with NEC wasn't completely advantageous, but NEC saw the now named PC Engine as an opportunity to get into the console gaming space, which had the potential for great reward, so they took the risk. The PC Engine, when it launched in 1987, was almost an instant hit. In 1988, it even went on to outsell the Famicom, which had seemingly ruled the Japanese islands since 1983. Once NEC was sure the PC Engine would have legs to stand on, they decided the console would be exported to the United States, to challenge the NES and Nintendo's seemingly undisputed playground of North America. NEC decided that it would launch the PC Engine in the United States, and it tasked American offices in Chicago to do just that. However, NEC needed the help of Hudson Soft to help market the system and software. Like NEC, Hudson Soft had to build a team to sell the PC Engine to Americans. Hudson Soft created an international division, because at that point in time, they had very limited English-speaking staff at the company, and they set up a division to start the process of selling the system. Because of the nature of the partnership between NEC and Hudson Soft, Hudson Soft needed to help NEC in this endeavor, as NEC had no real experience in the gaming industry at this point. 
Once NEC sent the marching orders for the PC engine to be sold, the American offices started the build-up to launch the system. NEC Technologies in Chicago, led by Keith Schaefer, started by putting together a launch team for the PC engine. The thought of the American offices was that they already had people from the game industry in the company. Schaefer, along with Bob Farber and Ken Wirt, had come to NEC from Atari. However, this wasn't from Atari's gaming division. They were from Atari's home computer division. At the time we went to NEC, we didn't have any idea about doing video game stuff anymore. Ken Wirt. The issue with building a team from former Atari employees was that coming from the computer division, they saw the market as a hardware business and primarily focused on hardware instead of software as a means to move units. So software was already behind hardware in terms of the team's growing priorities. As a result of no one on the launch team having software experience, that key piece of the home gaming console was largely ignored and would become a reoccurring theme with the system's North American debut. The launch team did, however, know that PC Engine was a great system because it had already proven itself in Nintendo's homeland. So the team set out right away doing focus testing on the console because it was already an existing product. It was easy to begin that phase of the operation and start showing it to potential customers. The console was met with a mixed reaction. PC Engine's rich graphics were a hit with anyone who saw them. However, the name PC Engine was met with less than enthusiastic focus groups. Ken Work was quoted as saying, the name PC Engine was a tad confusing for American consumers. NEC decided to redesign the system for North America. What was so unique about the PC Engine at the time was its form factor. It was dramatically smaller than just about any other major console that had come before it. This was thanks to the Hue Card technology and the efficiency of Hudson Soft's design. But the thought at the time was that something that small came off like a toy and not a serious home entertainment device. The redesign of the system had to reflect the power of the system and how it was deserving a place in the American living room alongside systems like the NES. The name change was the easiest part of the process. The name TurboGrafx-16 was chosen because it emphasized the system's speed and power and the cleaner graphics. And the 16 meaning the graphical bits the system brought to the table. The addition of the word Turbo fell well into the marketing material and led itself well to accessories. The TurboTap, the TurboPad, and the Hue cards were even renamed to the Turbo Chips. The physical redesign of the console, however, was a much more in-depth affair. Something to be considered when doing a redesign. Although it can be good to localize a design, there's always a ticking clock over the head of a prospective console. The PC Engine was already out. The Turbo Graphics, as it's now called, had to now wait for a complete redesign of its plastic shell which only increased the lead time until the console could hit store shelves and then face off against Nintendo's NES. NEC wanted the redesign to be perfect, and at times during this phase, the company went down rabbit holes, wasting months attempting to create a rubber-like coating for the rear expansion slot, which ultimately had to be abandoned because nothing they tried worked out. The design of the TurboGrafx is said to have been disliked by Hudson Soft. NEC America were attempting to emulate a piece of hi-fi electronics instead of a kid's game console. Because the NEC staff were considered the American market experts, the changes were ultimately accepted and pushed forward. John Brandsetter joined NEC later in the system's life around 1991 and wasn't ashamed to share his dislike of the system's redesign. Their idea was a dumb American stereotype. Bigger is better. That's all it is. NEC wanted the Turbo Graphics to be huge in more ways than one. NEC Japan gave the redesign effort its blessing and the time they asked for. This was because they were complacent in the success that it had with the PC Engine in Japan. The overconfidence within NEC only served to distract them and further delay the system getting to the market ahead of any potential rival. While NEC handled the North American console hardware, Hudson Soft pushed ahead with software for the system. Hudson Soft had to make a large number of titles for the system in Japan. And once NEC readied for launch in North America, Hudson Soft set out to localize titles for the American market. But Hudson Soft also set out to create tools for software development for Western studios, porting their tools to DOS for ease of entry for American developers. The TurboGrafx was facing an uphill battle in North America. The NES dominated the field in terms of retailers and developers. Nintendo had locked in most developers and made it rather difficult for companies to jump to other platforms thanks to Nintendo's rather brutal licensing agreements. Hudson Soft, thanks to its agreement with NEC, was the primary in terms of software development. Early in the process of the console's launch, 
in North America, they attempted to sow interest in the console and hosted a conference for prospective developers. The conference didn't lead to any Western developers signing on for the system, but it did, however, have one catastrophic event that impacted prospects of Electronic Arts ever becoming a third-party developer for the platform. In a meeting, Hudson staffers asked EA's team if it was up to the task of developing great CD-ROM games. We didn't think EA was obviously, or otherwise we wouldn't have to ask them so deeply, says Griner. EA took offense to that. They kind of walked out of the meeting and said, how dare you question us? The PC Engine enjoyed a number of third-party developers in Japan. The system's game lineup wasn't dominated by Hudson Soft like it was in the United States. The Japanese market for NEC had the advantage of a home computer ecosystem. The companies that had developed for NEC's PC-98 platform followed NEC over into the console market. NEC, however, did not have the kind of support in the United States, causing the system in North America to lag behind the Japanese market in terms of software support. NEC in Chicago was overconfident in their product. They saw the American market as ripe for the taking. However, the delay in release of the TurboGrafx cost valuable time. Retailers were excited for the prospect of a new system to sell to consumers. Nintendo's NES was a dominant platform, but was showing its age. The Sega Master System was effectively dead thanks to Nintendo's aggressive control of the market, and Sega's partnership with Tonka, failing to get inroads in with American retailers to make it viable. The staff at NEC didn't realize that they should have been watching for Sega during this time. The Mega Drive did launch in 1988 in Japan, but it didn't break Nintendo's grip or really challenge the PC Engine. However, the Mega Drive, renamed the Genesis in the United States, managed to hit store shelves two weeks before the TurboGrafx. Sega didn't want to waste time with a complete mold redesign and pushed straight to market with only basic cosmetic changes to the console. Any advantage NEC had with the early arrival of the PC Engine was lost and the potential momentum somewhat derailed. Sega even began attacking the TurboGrafx in ads designed to question the system's 16-bit credentials. Sega had been planning for the next war, after the Master System was defeated in rather lackluster fashion. Sega was ready for a fight, and NEC was already starting to get cold feet. One of the most daunting things for any console is launch titles. Something that would drive dramatic demand for your console. Nintendo had lucked out with their all-star plumber. Sega decided to go with an established arcade hit, Altered Life Beast, to drop sales. NEC and Hudson Soft had no such title in their library. They lacked something the company could rally behind in the form of a mascot. The TurboGrafx team selected Keith Courage and Alpha Zone as the pack-in title for the system. Problem was, that game didn't have any following outside of Japan. The game wasn't even a big hit in Japan as well. In a Gamasuit article, it stated the game was named Wataru in the Japanese market and was renamed to Keith Courage as a way to butter up to Keith Schaefer at NEC. The issue of packing titles for the TurboGrafx-16 is only further exacerbated. When you look at titles they had available as alternate options, one example is stated to have been a great potential pack-in is R-Type, the side-scrolling shmup title. The game was already successful in arcades, and the port on the TurboGrafx-16 was in top form, being incredibly smooth and responsive. But the focus testing at NEC didn't like the title because R-Type didn't test well with both boys and girls. The problem with this was that any new system needs a game that really pushes the hardware and shows the consumer that the console is worth their investment. Keith Courage didn't provide the right incentive. It wasn't an arcade title like R-Type, so the audience wasn't there. So Keith Courage couldn't get the crowd on board it needed. And it wasn't a well-known franchise, so name recognition wouldn't carry it anywhere. Perhaps one of the strangest things about the selection of Keith Courage as the primary pack and title is that the North American offices at NEC spent a great deal of time changing the hardware to fit their idealized localization concept. Yet the game they ultimately selected is perhaps the most Japanese option they could have picked. Something else that might have impacted game sales for the system was that NEC America decided that they needed to change the packaging on the games coming from Japan, believing that they knew the American market better. This is a very common thing that happened in North America in the late 80s and 90s. Game boxes that looked perfectly fine in Japan were often changed to something at the time that looked almost like a fourth grader drew it. This really didn't help much with the game's appeal. The TurboGrafx-16, despite having a set of impressive looking games at launch, faced an entrenched opponent. The American market had been long dominated by Nintendo, 
and even Sega had failed to break in at first. The TurboGrafx-16 was not only up against Nintendo, but Sega as well at this point. Sega was determined to be successful, and they didn't pull any punches. The TurboGrafx was a hybrid of 16 and 8-bit, so the system offered considerably more attractive graphics, but at the cost of system performance. The Genesis, on the other hand, was a fully 16-bit system, with all the advantages that provided. With that being said, TurboGrafx titles, at points, still looked better than some of the earlier Genesis fieldings. But that wasn't enough for the system, and sales of the system quickly slowed in their new war against the Genesis and Nintendo's still viable NES. But both systems were close in retail price, with $189 for the Genesis and $199 for the TurboGrafx. Nintendo had always used a system of controlled shortages to artificially drive demand for their products. And Nintendo routinely shorted orders to retailers in order to make sure there was always extra incentive to order more, and for that extra push to customers to buy Nintendo products while store supplies lasted. One of the main crippling factors was that NEC was overconfident in the TurboGrafx-16 and produced an estimated 750,000 units. NEC was quick to send the system to retailers, however the massive number of consoles created didn't sell as fast as NEC thought they would. The drawback to that was now NEC had less money on marketing because they had spent all that money on manufacturing systems, and it only added fuel to a growing fire of bad decisions. It was either run the risk of running out of consoles and missing the wave of demand, or they produce more and hope their limited marketing budget could pay off for them. The gamble on the larger supply did not pay off, and NEC now had a huge supply of systems that were not selling. The effect was NEC was starting to get cold feet about investing more money in the marketing. Sega, on the other hand, under Michael Katz, was successful with theirs, and invested more money in marketing as they were seeing a return on investment. The problem for NEC of America only got worse because NEC Japan didn't really have an understanding of the situation in North America. This was because the PC Engine in Japan was released with no real competition aside from the Famicom, an aging platform that had already been on the market for a number of years. The Mega Drive in Japan was a distant third falling further behind because it came out later than the PC Engine, which had made successful gains in the 16-bit market before any other console came into play. In the United States, the situation was reversed. The Genesis had the edge in North America and was leaving the TurboGrafx-16 behind. The situation was strained further by the fact Hudson Soft was receiving a considerable amount of money from the deal NEC had set up. Hudson Soft was not only receiving money for each system manufactured, but also was getting a cut of every Hue card sold. It was an astronomically good deal for Hudson Soft, who quite frankly, even as NEC was floundering, was still doing quite well, with next to no real risk of their own. These problems were compounded with the Japanese headquarters adopting a wait-and-see type policy about the turbo graphics. They didn't want to invest any more serious capital on the console, because it was getting savagely beaten. And this is after the first month, where the sell-through rate was absolutely dismal. NEC said that more product was going to hit the market and make an impact. The CD add-on and eventually a handheld would surely change the tide. However, ultimately this wouldn't prove enough to draw more attention to the console and sell more units. The TurboGrafx faced a serious game supply problem. The Japanese market had loads of third-party support for the PC Engine, but the TurboGrafx-16 was not drawing any support in the West, and the console continued to suffer from a lack of native homegrown content. The problem of no Western interest was only compounded by the Western system's poor sales, which had another contributing factor of no Western developer wanting to risk investing in the system, because not only that, but because the Hue card production runs were also prohibitively expensive. So the upfront cost of getting a game to market on the TurboGrafx-16 was looking less and less attractive as the system continued to sit on store shelves. NEC at least had some clever ideas to try and boost the console's appeal. NEC had never really had a coin-op division, but thanks to the TurboGrafx-16, it looked like something that could have been a possibility. NEC partnered with an American arcade distributor called United Amusements and marketed a concept that would allow for existing arcade cabinets to be modified with a TG-16, turning the cabinet into a new game for a considerably lower cost than buying a new cabinet. The impressive feat of the TurboGrafx-16 kits was that they only cost around $1,800, and came with four games and offered the owner the ability to change out games on the fly as they saw fit after installation. There was a great deal of hype behind the project initially, with NEC stating that they spent more money on R&D for games than Nintendo's entire income. 
The dream of arcade TurboGrafx-16 games seemingly died in 1990, along with much of the system's initial momentum. There is speculation that NEC's attempt to enter the coin-op space actually impacted their ability to license other arcade hits as a result. Unfortunately, the arcade conversion kits are very rare. It's theorized that maybe only 100 to 1,000 of these units actually sold during the run. The systems were actually PC engines that were modified, but it was a unique attempt to gather more attention for the system. It's not often you see a home console try to invade the arcade space. The belief in a new technology innovating and making something more attractive to consumers is a gamble some companies have made successfully. NEC Japan was betting that a CD add-on for the TurboGrafx-16 would change the plight of the console. CDs were not only a much larger storage medium, but also considerably cheaper to produce than hue cards. The TurboGrafx-16 was facing a simple battle of economics. TurboGrafx-16 games were often more expensive than their rivals. The introduction of a CD add-on was thought to be a game-changer for the system and make it more attractive to consumers. However, that was NEC of Japan's take on it. NEC of America was starting to be hesitant about releasing another add-on for the system. The TurboGrafx-16 suffered a basic design holdover from the economically sleek PC engine. That system had one controller port due to the system's smaller size. The dramatically larger TG-16 kept the same single controller port and required an adapter for an additional controller. So the system was already in a losing battle of utility against an established dynamic of two ports on their rival consoles. So economically, the system is at a price disadvantage straight out of the box in comparison to its competition. NEC America's hesitation came from the CD add-on's price tag. They tried to get a lower price for the unit, but eventually it was put to market at a price of $399, and that was towards the end of 89-1990. The add-on also had no pack-in titles, and the only two games available were Fighting Street and Monster Lair. I mean, the hardware was decent enough, right? When we added the CD-ROM, we should have been able to do a lot more with that. But we didn't pursue it that much because it just added too much cost to the game unit, I guess, O'Keefe says. NEC faced a pervasive problem with publishers. That being, NEC was just about the only company publishing games for the Turbo Graphics. Even companies that had made games for the PC Engine in Japan and had publishing arms in the United States were not porting their games to the TurboGrafx. NEC was forced to localize many of the titles to the system themselves. A number of those Japanese game developers were instead choosing to publish their games on the Genesis. Issues that NEC ran into was that when they tried to license games to the system, NEC was not willing to front the costs required to get a real sports icon for a game franchise. EA had the John Madden franchise in 1990, and Sega was working with Joe Montana for his franchise in 1991. NEC didn't have the will to spend the money required for a sports personality that would boost game sales. So instead, NEC went forward with TV Sports, a game franchise with no player license or even league licenses. NEC even chose to use ICOM and Cineware to port games from their PC titles to the TG-16, which, at the cost of two games from them, could have paid to localize six PC Engine titles to North America. It was a factor of the TurboGrafx-16 just didn't have a library of titles that was growing fast enough to attract more customers. TurboGrafx was failing to get a large install base and was beginning to look like a financial risk for anyone wanting to publish a game for it. As a result, many companies started to license games to NEC for them to publish. This resulted in a misconception that there was no actual publishers in the West aside from NEC, which was not helping them attract more publishers. The PC Engine, in contrast, had an expansive library of games that grew every year. The TurboGrafx-16, however, was constantly fighting to get more. Sega had experience with its arcade library and knew what worked well as a home title. NEC lacked this experience. It's even stated that some NEC staff would take games home and let their kids decide on what games to port over. NEC had a fundamental lack of experience in the game space, and it only continued to hurt them. The staff at NEC America also gravely underestimated Sega's staying power before that point. Sega had the advantage of a growing collection of third-party publishers to support their console, EA being a large player in that arena. NEC, thanks to the work of Hudson Soft, did have a growing library of first-party titles that gave the system enough energy to keep the fight going. It wasn't until 1990 that NEC finally had its mascot, however. Bonk's Adventure Bonk's Adventure was a great platformer that finally gave the TG-16 something the company could get behind and push the console forward. Where Keith Courage had failed to give the system a unique identity, Bonk provided something 
that had a much wider appeal. A slick platformer that was more akin to Mario than Keith Courage's unique flavor of platformer. Bonk's arrival didn't herald the rise of the TG-16, however. It was just a little too late to really give the system the shove it needed. NEC had always seemingly been against license deals, but there was an attempt to change that with getting the Madden franchise onto the platform. However, this deal ended up as a large mistake for NEC, as the Madden game itself wouldn't be coming from EA. Rather, it would buy the rights to the name, and then Hudson Soft in Japan would develop the game. Which in hindsight was another mistake, because instead of inviting EA to start making games on the platform, they simply bought the name and moved forward with that. To top that off, the Madden title wouldn't even be out on the available base system. It would come out on the CD add-on. Nineteen ninety could have been the turning point for NEC in its war against Sega and Nintendo. Only it wasn't. The year dished out more defeats to the company. The warehouses were still packed with unsold systems, and NEC thought it could change its favor by introducing the Turbo Express, a handheld unit that was very impressive for the time, given it could play the same hue cards used by the TG16 console. Only it wasn't selling. At a price tag of two forty nine, it wasn't faring well against the Game Boy and Game Gear, respectively. NEC was adrift. Not wanting to invest more into marketing because of the bad sales, and the bad sales because the system didn't have much of a marketing budget needed to defeat Sega or Nintendo. And Nintendo was gearing up to release the Super Famicom, which NEC was beginning to get nervous as the only real saving grace through 1990 was their success with the PC Engine in Japan, and that too wasn't to last. There was discussion among NEC North America about trying to rebrand to a higher end hi fi type appliance and trying to market it through places like Sharper Image, or other high-end establishments. But that thinking came too late, and NEC was getting ready to withdraw from the game market in North America. The fight had been something they were optimistic about, but that optimism was unfortunately met with a harsh reality. What ended up killing the TurboGrafx-16 for NEC was the massive stock of systems they still had on hand, and the fact that they failed to understand the fundamental argument for game consoles. That was you make money by selling the games, and lose money on the hardware. NEC America's culture was that they thought they were selling a hi-fi piece of electronics, and not a game system. The company never brought on someone with real contemporary game industry experience to act as the chief over the division and push it to make it work. Sega, despite Cat's success, brought on Tom Kalinske to push the system because they felt they needed a change in order to be successful. It paid off for them. There was never such a shake-up at NEC, and they stagnated because of it. They chose to stay the course and slowly wore themselves down by a death of a thousand cuts, as the systems lingered on store shelves and NEC refused to invest more money in marketing to sell the system. NEC wanted out. They managed to make it through 1991, releasing titles and supporting the system. But it wasn't long before NEC started to negotiate with Hudson Soft. Hudson Soft had made out of the TG-16 arrangement very well, given they made money off just about every aspect of the system. NEC had taken a beating and wanted to back away from the North American market. A deal was worked out that a new company would be formed and support the TurboGrafx-16 in an effort to save face for NEC and Hudson Soft, and the company would support the remaining loyal users of the TurboGrafx. This new company would primarily fall under Hudson Soft's control. TurboGrafx Technologies, Inc. was created. TTI for short. The company began operation in Los Angeles in a move that would take it away from Chicago. The staff at NEC who stayed were then transferred over to TTI, and they thought this would be their chance to change the fate of the TurboGrafx, bringing the system back into the console war with full force. That, however, wasn't the case. After a few attempts by the staff in North America to bring over multiple titles, it just wasn't happening. The Japanese side of the business just wasn't allowing it or allowing TTI to push the system because they didn't want to spend any more money or the money required to make it viable. There were instances of TTI creating lists of 10 to 15 games that they wanted ported to North America, and they would often only get one. It was something that continued to frustrate the American offices of TTI, who knew they could be successful if only they would be given the funds to rival that of Nintendo or Sega. By the time the masters at Hudson Soft were ready to release the TurboGrafx Duo, Despite promising excitement in Japan, none of the support required to launch a system in North America was given. From 1992 to 1993, TTI continued the business with next to no support. 
the company limped on trying to sell the embattled Turbo Graphics. Once 1993 hit, most retailers were no longer even carrying the system or games. Most games at this point were now being sold by mail order. And in 1994, at summer CES, TTI officially ended the Turbo Graphics. The Turbo Graphics 16 is a tragic tale. It's a system that could have truly shifted the North American landscape. But too many mistakes were made, and it ultimately fell too far behind to ever take advantage of what it truly had to offer. Well, thank you for watching the Historic Nerd today. Hope you have a wonderful day, evening, night, or whatever it is you're doing. Bye.